Systems thinking is an approach to building understanding that has the following core tenet. The structure of the system is responsible for driving the behavior. By structure, I refer to the rules, procedures, policies, ideas, and thinking that we use to make the decisions. For this video, we're going to focus in on behavior. We're going to focus on a key skill of a systems thinker that I refer to as dynamic thinking. Dynamic thinking helps us to identify and frame an issue and how it plays out over time. And we can do this in a way that helps us to also to begin building our understanding of what the structure is for generating that behavior. In order to understand this concept of dynamic thinking, let's use an example. Assume for the moment that you're on an executive team of a large corporation. Last quarter's profits were in the red. How do you feel? Not good, right? What would you likely want to do in order to respond to this event? Most likely you try to do cost cutting measures such as laying off people, reducing training, maybe getting rid of a part of the business. Now let's assume that over the last year, you saw your profits go from positive millions of dollars down to negative millions of dollars. What kinds of reactions might you take then? Well, most likely you'd still be doing the same kinds of things. Cost cutting, probably worse cost cutting. You'd probably really be thinking about divesting part of the business. You might be laying off people, et cetera. Being a member of the executive team, you might be likely to also be thinking about how could you get off this team or who might you blame? Now, let's assume that over the last several years you see this pattern. It's oscillating, right? Several peaks and valleys, but they look approximately the same. How do you feel now? Probably a sigh of relief. Why? Because you now have a picture of the business that you're working with. It's probably something like a seasonal business, right? Or maybe it's a commodity business, like oil, where prices go up and down, but they have sort of regular patterns. Now what are some of your solutions? Well, if you're a seasonal business, you might try to figure out some way during the off seasons to also generate some revenue. Maybe if you're a commodity business, you'll figure out ways to cut costs or reduce expenses during the downturns so that you're more profitable. And if you're an entrepreneurial type venture like Apple or 3M or others, you might invest in R&D so that over time during the downturns when you're investing in R&D and the upturns, you get to ride it up. So the fundamental difference here between the primary way of reacting in the first set of situations, which are reactions, cost cutting, slashing, et cetera, and this more proactive approach is that you now have a picture of the business in your mind. And this is the value of dynamic thinking. You're much more likely to see the business for how it is and how it works. And by doing so, you start to see the structure and have an opportunity for making the changes that you wish to make if you're going to improve the quality of the future that you're trying to bring about. Here's another example. Let's assume that you're trying to reduce childhood obesity, and you're looking for a state that's doing a good job to be a coach to other states. In this graph, A has the worst childhood obesity relative to Z. So who would you choose to coach? You'd choose state Z. Now, looking at this graph, you see something different, right? A is getting better, while Z is getting worse. So now who would you choose to coach? Well, you would choose A. They've obviously figured it out, whereas Z may have something to worry about. This is the value of using a dynamic perspective. By having a trend line, you get a fuller, richer, more operational picture of what's going on. You're more likely to identify the right leverage points to lean on. We're going to now talk about how you can use systems thinking and dynamic thinking to develop your own trend graphs. First, try to figure out what variable, if you understood it, might really help you to understand the issue in a deep, full, rich way. Think about, as that trend, what has been happening to it? Has it been getting worse? Has it been getting better? something where you might have an ability to really delve into the issues. So once you've figured out the variable, then think about could you normalize it. By normalizing it, I mean turning it into a percent, or an average, or dollars per capita, or outcome per dollar spent. So why would we want to normalize a variable? Well, let's assume you're trying to compare the amount of money spent on sports in two different states, high school sports, for example, comparing Texas versus Vermont. Total dollars spent in Texas versus total dollars spent in Vermont, probably a huge difference. But maybe if you looked at dollars spent per student in Vermont and dollars spent per student in Texas, they might be more comparable. The next step is to figure out over what time frame you're going to analyze this. If you're working in the public policy space, for example, you might be looking at multiple years, maybe even decades. Things in that arena, such as obesity and other demographics associated issues, often take a long time to change. This becomes the x-axis. In other words, what's the time over which we're trying to solve this problem or understand this problem? You would then on the y-axis figure out what's that variable and how it's been changing over time over that period. You could continue sketching out into the future where it's going to go if you do nothing. 
if we continue to be ineffective at solving this, or if we ignore it, if it's business as usual, what's the price we pay into the future? This can be highly motivating and to get people excited about working on the problem with you. You can also use this as an opportunity to engage people in developing a vision of the future. If we were wildly successful in the next 10 to 20 years, what would happen over that period of time with this variable? Would it get better? How so? This can also cause people to be motivated to try and work on the problem with you. I found other kinds of graphs to be useful for a variety of reasons. The first graph I'm going to refer to is the family of graphs. Why a family? Well, you might be delving into one issue, but there might be multiple aspects of it that different people or different stakeholder groups are interested in. For example, childhood obesity. Some people may be interested in the short-term implications of childhood obesity on children, and you might have a graph that looks at that. Others might be looking at the economic costs, how it might be playing out into the future in healthcare costs. There might be a graph on that. And others might be interested in terms of looking at where it's going and comparing it in different regions. And so there might be a graph for that. Putting all these graphs together in a family of graphs allows you to engage people in the learning process and is more likely to make sure that you get the richer, fuller picture of the issue that you're trying to solve. Another type of graph is what I refer to as the narrative graph. This is a graph that may look at a trend line over time, say in the past, where you can look at different events or interventions that occurred along that trend line. This gives you an ability to anchor different experiences along that trend line and to tell a dynamic story. Another type of graph is what I refer to as a goals and initiatives impact graph. This type of graph helps you to get team members on the same page about what are the achievable goals and how you're going to get there. Take, for example, the CDC may be trying to implement evidence-based programs, and they want to increase the percentage of the target population that adopts it. On a team of four members, perhaps, three of them believe you could triple that. And one person believes the best you can do is to double it. Right there, you have an opportunity for learning. Why is it that three team members are much more optimistic than the fourth? In addition, you could then ask, how would that play out over time? You may find that one team member thinks that you can quickly triple the percentage of adoption from that target population. Another team member might think they would take a long period of time to get there, while a third might actually think there could be a worse before better dynamic, which could be really scary in the midst of implementation, right? Applying a goals and initiatives impact graph allows you to get clearer about what the assumptions are people are using, the mental models, and to be able to get on the same page about what the interventions could possibly be and what's achievable. This increases the likelihood that you'll have an effective, high leverage strategy in the future. Another type of graph I use with teams is what I refer to as the leading and lagging indicators graph. This type of graph helps you to visualize the causal linkages between multiple factors in a, in a system. Pretend, for example, that you're working in a community and you're trying some community improvement initiative where at the end of it there's some variable in the community that's getting a lot better. It may take a long time before that happens. So for example, you may need funding to occur before some sort of a resource is applied to allow people to improve that community. But it also might take even more before you get the funding some level of community support and engagement to get there. So you can see in a graph like this, the first thing that would improve, a leading indicator, might be community engagement. The next level that it might improve, the next indicator, might be something financially related. And the final ultimate outcome might be years in the future before it happens. If you were only using the lagging indicator, you might be discouraged early on if you didn't see that improving, even if the engagement or the funding was starting to take place. Having a leading lagging indicator graph like this will allow you to make sure that you don't misunderstand or misread the tea leaves, so to speak, and make sure that you know that as you're moving forward, you're getting where you want to go. If a leading indicator doesn't change when you expect it, then you have an opportunity for learning. Maybe your theory or your thinking was wrong, or maybe you need to look at some other variables as well. No matter what happens, though, a graph like this can give you the early warning indicators that you're either on or off track and create an accelerated pace of learning that's essential, particularly in situations like public policy, which often move in glacial speeds. So I hope you can see that there are many different ways to use trend over time graphs. They help us to improve our ability to apply dynamic thinking. All of the graphs that we've just covered give you a better picture of the system that you're trying to change. That's the structure behind the behavior. You start with the behavior you're trying to change, understand what's the price you pay for not solving it, and then doing a trend over time, expanding your temporal horizons, gives you a much better picture of the system and opportunities for identifying the leverage points you need. So get the picture, get the leverage. 
Using trend over time graphs can make you more effective. I encourage you to use them.